So we're meeting for the first time in person, but we've all pretty much been on each other's podcasts. Daniel, I think we spoke about a year ago. No, like six months ago. Six months ago. Wow. Yeah. And Mike, we were we were on Future Thinkers, or you were on. Yeah, we did a, a dual episode. Yeah, also. we did a dual episode three months ago, something like that. Yeah. Yeah. So it's really interesting. We're at the same event here. Um, we're obviously kind of in a lot of the same networks, and we're looking. We're interviewing a lot of the same people. Uh, we've all had Jordan Greenhall on, Daniel Schmachtenberger. Um, have you had Jamie Wheel? No, on? not yet. No. It's going to happen. Yes. Yeah, yeah, inevitable. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so, yeah, it, I think it's really interesting to talk about kind of where we feel, like we all feel that we're part of the same conversation. Mm -hmm. um, looking at different parts of it with different emphases, I think um, we can talk about what kind of the different emphases are. But what's really interesting is that this conversation seems to be becoming, and this is dangerous to talk about without sounding really wanky and really kind of uh, pretentious, but there's a sense that this conversation is becoming a little bit more self-aware. Mm. And we're kind of trying to play with different names for it. I've heard it called the meta web, the sense-making web. Um, intellectual deep web was something compared to kind of the intellectual dark web was something that we were playing with for a while. Um, what's your favorite word? I, I actually really like the uh, intellectual light web because it's a little bit, it's a kind of like a little bit farcical, you know, and doesn't, it, it clearly is not taking itself too seriously, which I appreciate. Um, but the sense making web, I think, is sense making web and game B seem to be the two frames that I see having the most momentum, at least like in my neck of the woods. Yeah. For me, it's minimum viable meme is what I'm looking for. So I actually really agree with you on game B. I think that works. Yeah. 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 And how would you summarize? the differences in terms of like your particular focus and your particular focus on uh, future thinkers? We have less of a structure than I think you guys do. We, we kind of go wherever we feel like going. Um, historically speaking, that's been the case. Now we are definitely focusing a lot more on sense making and, and sovereignty as far as Daniel Smotterberger has defined it. That's become a huge thing. I, like we've always wanted to f focus on big problems in the world and how do we actually start to approach those. And you and I have both continually landed on the conclusion that it becomes it, more important to focus on individual sovereignty and how we make sense of the world. That's where everything starts. Yeah, yeah I, I suppose like, you know, um, in my mind, I think there are, I, I obviously I'm an avid listener to, all, I listen to both of your projects. I don't really listen to my own, you know, but uh, I think, uh, so the distinction that I feel for me uh, is something, uh, about the exploration one i feel like my podcast is a bit more like kind of philosophical and sort of like uh performative like there's a kind of aesthetic to it that isn't quite like an interview it's more like a, a dance like a conversational dance like for me i was very inspired by um like authentic relating and uh sort of just the possibility of having a beautiful conversation where something new is discovered in the meeting of the conversation, right? And, and that definitely takes place, I know, in, in both of your projects. But for me, that's more of a kind of aesthetic, like, that's been guiding me the whole way. Um, and, yeah, again, like, the kind of playing more in this philosophical, conceptual territory, I think, uh, feels like it's very much a part of my project. Yeah. Yeah, and I'm interested. I mean, we, we're, we're all kind of talking about practice now. It's like the, there's a real focus on practice and um, how to get ourselves into these spaces for generative dialogue and sovereignty that's a real focus for all of us but I think definitely I feel that with with you Daniel because I'm fascinated by you're kind of a, a, a modern monk mm -hmm. a hermit living in a monastery mm -hmm. putting these kind of what Peter Lindbergh would call mimetic artifacts out into the world that must be a really interesting dynamic yeah. to be part of. Well, it, yeah, definitely. I mean, it, 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 it is also the case that it was through the exploration of the podcast that I, it was revealed to me that I actually had to go into training to embody the sort of world that was being called for, I think, in the conversations we're having. Like, it was revealed to me how important personal transformation was. Like, not that I was, like, not doing work on myself, but just how core that was and how, um, to some degree, I was, like, fooling myself, thinking that I was more in integrity with what that was asking than uh, I was, you know? And so that's part of the reason I went back. And yeah, like, I don't know that, 
I would be able to have the conversations I'm having without like participating in this kind of space of practice, you know, for, for me to, to do it. Because a lot of these things can get so abstract if you're not like living it too. It's, I, I don't feel like it would work or make sense. Yeah, and I, I want to want to back up a little bit, and just for people maybe who are watching who are not sort of familiar by, we're, we're taking a lot for granted here in terms of even talking about practice and talking about sovereignty. Um, like for, for me, what I found very, really useful was I did a training as a counsellor. Um, so I've got a background as a journalist, but I also did a training as a counsellor um, about a year and a half, two years ago. And I really felt a different quality in my interviews from that space when I was able to be much more present and much more available. And that, I think, has really informed a lot of the, the interviews that, that I've done since on, on Rebel Wisdom. And it's, it's much more about like, how present can you be and how present in the moment can you be. And there's all sorts of different practices that can help with that, from mindfulness to um, circling, authentic relating, all that sort of stuff. Um, what would you say, Mike, what's your kind of relationship to, to practice and how have you felt things shifting? You know, you've kind of put it in perspective for me a little bit too, just describing your, your path through this. Um, the conversation that we have on Future Thinkers is really a couple's conversation. Um, and it, it started off just this breakfast time conversation and has gone through. So we've had this, these sort of contemplative practices and conversations about psychology and, and developmental psychology and, and society and these things just became something we thought maybe other people would be interested in so we turned on the, the recorder so the conversation that we have with other people as well is kind of the same it's like they're entering into our conversation that's continually evolving um, the practice itself has just been part of our lives just it, it wasn't something worth talking about for us until the podcast turned on um, but deep meditation, we focused a lot in our meditation practice on resilience and, and focusing on dealing with and processing difficult emotions. And in doing that for a long enough time, it became really difficult to find more things to become emotional over or, or react reactive to. Um, and that was interesting. So we just started talking about that. Yeah, just to say, it's a real shame UV can't be with us. Well, it's because she's seven months pregnant now, so she can't move. So we're yeah. going to have our own little psycho psychology experiment in a few months. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that'll be a learning experience. Yeah, um, yeah and, and also I just want to... What, what's really interesting to me as well is that the... I don't know if it's partly just the sort of the personal biases that I'm personally bringing to it and maybe we're all bringing to it, but this sense of a lot of things moving in the same direction that this sort of personal practice world yeah. has been coming together more with the systems change and the existential risk and all these bigger topics. But it feels like there's a really fascinating teleology direction to this conversation that I think we're all feeling. Um, and I wonder whether that's our, our personal bias that we're projecting into it or whether it is, an, it is something that's emerging from the conversation. I have something to say about that I think is really um, has been really interesting to watch because I think I've got my podcast has been around for quite a while uh, compared to you guys um, and it's just been this conversation that's just been really um, whatever we feel like that month it's never had a direction or a line but other people have pointed out to us that over time years of doing this there is a line to it it's there is a narrative that has emerged and so that with this movement there's a lot of focus on how do we direct it? How do we become conscious and direct it? And I feel like the whole idea of emergence and collective sense making is that it comes along without your focus and attention. It just emerges out of its own uh, properties. And I think the attempt to kind of focus and direct it is actually almost working against the movement. Hmm. Yeah. yeah, I mean, so what's coming up for me is it's like, um, <clears throat> You know, there's a way in which we are actually we are participating in the, like, the, the creation of a new meta narrative, right? And we're kind of like, as we're participating in the creation of it, we're also being subjected to it, right? And it's, there's this kind of feedback loop where it starts to gain some momentum of its own, and then it's kind of like, wait, are we biasing it? Or are we observing it? What is happening here? And I think we're actually at a really interesting inflection point where, as you're saying, like, it feels like. Is something happening here? Like, are we doing it? And it actually is a lot like some spaces in meditation, right? Where you're like, am I making this happen? Am I, am I doing this? Or is this like actually happening or what, what, you know? And I think that actually that is just how it is, right? Like 
that's how it's going to go down is we're gonna like participate this into being and it's like not gonna be real or not real, but it's gonna like have an impact. Yeah. It's gonna do stuff. Yeah. And it's like important and significant. Yeah. Yeah. I think the line through it all will emerge in a lot more clarity as more people will participate in the conversation. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, and it, 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 the piece around like there's this kind of feeling of like harmony or integrity of the personal work and the kind of like vision of the future of systems in general of like this kind of like idea of omni win, right? It's like omni win planet, yes. Omni win nation, yes. Omni win community, yes. Omni win like in this triad, yes. Omni win in my psyche, right? Like there are parts of me, can I bring them into harmony? So they're all kind of like playing a game well together. And it's like, I think that the, to the degree that we can see that harmony conceptually and live it like actually, like hell yes, right? And I, I don't know that that was in the mimetic space like very long ago. It certainly wasn't in my mimetic space and like I was deep in, I was a deep nerd about this stuff and like this feels new to me. Yeah. Yeah, I feel like there's so many different branching points here. Um, one of which is the nature of the online space does seem to create these positive feedback loops. Like, um, th there's not a scarcity. Like, uh, the, for example, um, people can watch or listen to all of our podcasts and the fact that we are talking to each other is not, there's, there's no scarcity here. It's not like if they're not watching my channel, they're, they're watching your channel and we're in rivalry with each other. Whereas where I, I come from, um, Channel 4 News and the BBC and you're not promoting each other's channels. You don't promote each other's channels because if someone's watching BBC News, they're not watching Channel 4 News or whatever. The, the, there's an implicit... Um, so there is already in the digital world the possibility for non-rivalrous dynamics in a way that I don't think there were before. I mean, attention is finite on some level, so it doesn't go all the way down, but, but certainly um, there are m many more positive feedback loops in the new digital media environment that there were in the old media environment. Mm -hmm. um, the, other, the other branch that I was feeling as well was this sort of omni-win mm. dynamic you're talking about in game B, the idea of game B as the sort of non-rivalrous space. Um, I had a real realization on our most recent uh, workshop, men's retreat, where I was like, oh, actually, this space that we're creating is, is a game B space. Yeah. Like, I'm sure you've had the experience as well on a workshop of just this space that opens up on say day th day two or day three where you can just feel the field change and there's a lot more authenticity and there's this sort of sense of another a third or mm -hmm. another space opening up mm -hmm. where the, the air becomes sort of heavy with significance mm -hmm. and there's, there's no real way language for explaining this kind of stuff that doesn't feel cliched or weird mm -hmm. um, but I, I realized in the closing circle I was like okay this is this is game B, this is what we've been making all these films about, because um, there is something that we're craving on such a deep level where we're in a space where everyone wants the best for each other, and when someone really kind of has a realisation or shows up in a new way, they're honoured for that, and it's like, wow, yes, I, someone shares something really vulnerable or has some kind of insight, and everyone is there with them and wanting the best for them, and it's like, oh, we've lost so much of that because we're caught in these zero-sum games with each other and defensiveness patterns and all of this. Um, so yeah, that's two kind of possible branches for the conversation, I don't know. Yeah. Which one you want to jump on? Yeah. I, I've been trying to figure out what it is at the heart that, that changes in, in that group dynamic, you know, from the, there's not a flow state, there's what, what you described there, to suddenly we're all in harmony with each other. And I'm trying to isolate that point and, and get down to the bottom of it. And I, I think it has something to do with our desire to be perceived a certain way and project our, our best image to each other. And in doing so, we're less focused on the truth of what's happening in the conversation and more on how we're being perceived. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so I put a lot of focus in, into that and with what we are talking about in the podcast now and, and in our courses, that has become just such a, a central point. And in focusing on that, I've noticed an unlocking and sense making immediately and an unlocking in collective intelligence that is just, I, I haven't been able to experience anywhere else and with any other groups um, in such a stable way as what we've been able to do with our, our weekly calls, um, the, the course calls. And it's just, 
it's so simple, um, but it's so hard to, to get through to that point where you can actually just listen and look for truth uh, in a group conversation. Yeah, and I think it's really significant that, um, and I have a similar uh, sense of what is happening in the, in the monastery, in the community that I, that I live at, that there's a way in which, and I think it actually has always been the case, that monasteries have been these kind of omni-win local systems, right? Um, and that there's the most important teaching there is actually what it's like just to be in that space, right? And, and if you do workshops, if you've done retreats, you, you get to this point, you're like, oh, this is so wonderful. This is, and then you say, but I have to go back to the real world, right? And it's like, is, there, is what we're talking about to some degree like taking the real world and making it more like these like beautiful spaces that we sometimes get to participate because we're very privileged? And it's like, maybe, that sounds amazing. That sounds really great. And I think it's cool that we all have like different ways that we're offering these kinds of experiences, like, you know, whether it's online or residential or a weekend retreat, you know, and that you can get this like taste. Because I think that that's, there is the, the conversational aspect, the cognitive aspect, but then there's the, 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 the taste, the flavor of it that I think is perhaps more important. Yeah. Actually, probably more important. I don't, I don't know. Yeah, I've always found those uh, sort of peak state experiences, and there's other ways of getting there as well, the sort of plant medicines and um, th those peak state experiences, like those really extreme ones as well, I think almost feel like a sort of calling card. Mm. And one of the most fascinating conversations I had around that was with Jordan Peterson just before the cameras were rolling. Um, so I went over uh, it's two, lovely, isn't it? yeah, so two, two years ago when I did the interview with Jordan Peterson, um, I'd gone to his lecture the night before and he talked about Jung's idea of the self with a capital S as something that is calling to us from the future. Mm. That this sort of potential, that the, potenti of our, uh, the potentiality of our personality calling to us from the future through our interests, through the things that we are drawn to do in our lives. There's some sort of relationship with this sort of kind of, I don't know, feels a bit like Terence McKenna's kind of... Um, object at the end of time, almost. Mm. Um, but, and I feel that, like, that made so much sense. I just had this kind of like realization and I talked to him just before the cameras were rolling about how meaningful I found that because it felt like my real peak state experiences where I've like been in a, in a completely open flow state and they've lasted for like a couple of weeks at a time to a couple of months at a time where I'm just like, I don't need to think, I just act from this real deeper space in myself those peak experiences are like almost like calling to me mm. from in, in some way. They have this deeper resonance that feels like it's, it's something in the future that's calling and orienting myself towards in an almost like gravitational field kind of way. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Does that, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, I've, I've even heard people at this gathering refer to like attractors, mm. right? Which is a similar kind of sentiment, I think more in terms of like systems theory where you have like the possibility of like an attractor in, in uh, one teacher that I really appreciate talks about like the angel out ahead, right? They're kind of like tracking something that you may never actually reach, but it's kind of like calling you forward in a way that it perhaps actually that the, the desire to define it too rigidly conceptually might actually kill it, right? So that's kind of why the flavor actually might be more important than the conversation around it. But I feel that way. Well, it's not like, for me, it's not just peak experiences. And that's why I think the, the, the community I live in uh, for me is very significant is that it's not pleasant to be there all the time. Sometimes it's actually quite horrible, right? But it's within the context of a system that you can trust, right? You know that people are there for their, the, their benefit and your benefit. And like everything is kind of like chill, like and trustworthy and wholesome and good fundamentally. And that's, there's just a different way of being that that enables that you don't actually see how fucked up this world is until you've been in that. And again, it's like, d please do not imagine that being in a monastery is just one peak experience after another. It is not that, definitively. Related to your point about the gravity well um, and the the future attractor, future version of yourself. There's an interview that I did with Kirby Surprise, who wrote this book about synchronicity. 
And he talked about synchronicities, you know, those, those experiences we have of um, calling someone on the phone and they're thinking of calling us on the phone and we just connect or, you know, in this field, it seems like there's a lot of discussion about um, synchronicity and synchronistic events, um, what you get, what you focus on is what you get. Um, in this book, he talked about how synchronicity can work forwards and backwards in time. Like there can be a future event that's pulling you towards it. Like one of the examples he uses is actually an argument with his wife, this big blow up argument that was rippling backwards and caught, he was noticing all these synchronicities leading up to this event of like heightened emotional uh, uh, frustration and, and it all just led up to this point. This is all metaphysical and unprovable, but um, just thinking about what we would do if we were gonna design our experience outside of time, if consciousness can exist outside of time, how would we do it? Uh, and I, I would picture it being like, the design would be something like these gravity wells of experience that just pull us through uh, in time. And it, it kind of lined up with his book. Yeah, what's coming up for me too is that it's, um, you know, it's, these ideas don't even have to necessarily be so metaphysical, right? Like the idea that time is like linear and the past is back there and the present is where we are now and the future is coming. Like we are, I think part of what we are all sensing is that like we are in a time of deconstruction mm -hmm. and deconstruction is happening both in like the political, economic, social world. But I, I think it also, there is an invitation for it to happen within the kind of world of our metaphysics and assumptions about the, how reality kind of functions. Mm -hmm. And like for a question for me is like, are we free to play with the idea that perhaps time flows differently than we've been taught? Right? Not like to make a grand claim about the nature of reality, but just to see what that opens up in terms of a space of experimentation that might allow us to kind of like, I don't know, do something different because what we've been doing is not going to get us to where we need to go. And so it's like, yeah, like those kinds of sort of like flips, I think, are so significant. And, and it, but then if like you're listening and you're like, that's not how time works. It's like, hmm, okay. So it sounds like you're not free to play in that way. Yeah. You know? Yeah, the, it's interesting. The discussion about these kind of metaphysical things always have to come with this disclaimer. Like, it's not proven. I don't, I don't really mean what I'm saying, but it's really just an experiment, a conversation. See where we can take it. And what lens do you look through um, that gives you a completely different perspective on the world and maybe makes other things make sense? Like, this whole idea of synchronicity and, and time being only something we experience in a linear fashion, but maybe it's all existing at the same time. That allows you you know, more lenses to view things through. Which is something that reminds me of John Vivekey's work in particular. Because mm -hmm. um, he, it's really interesting to, to see the development of consciousness and the development of the idea of even linear time. Uh, this sort of Western narrative of a, of a beginning, a middle and an end, and time as a kind of arrow moving in one direction is actually, it actually had a beginning. Like it's not just the way, understanding how much of our cognitive framework has actually is not pre stuff that we just assume is pre given has actually arrived at certain moments in the past and we were in more of an eternal now before then and maybe we're we're, we're in one of those big shifts where we're becoming aware that like becoming aware of how our thought has been patterned gives us the chance to actually maybe reflect on a lot of the what we assumed was pre given cognitively um, and there's also another link that just came up with the internet. I think Jordan Hall has talked about it as being eternal memory. So we're now in a, from the idea of kind of synchronous um, broadcast media, we're now in a, in a world of eternal memory and kind of an eternal now in some sense as well. Yeah, yeah. Douglas Rushkoff writes about this in his book, Present Shock, and it, which is really striking for me. It's like, it, it, there's, it, it's like we're in an eternal presence, but it's like a very... Uh, Mm, like not the kind of eternal presence that you know you want to be in it's an eternal presence of distraction and like confrontation from your devices and from like the world coming and invading your space yeah. right and it's yeah it's uh there is a really funny way in which we're, we, we are forced into an eternal presence like we've lost that sense of historicity against our will, against our will. <laughs> yeah 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 yeah, yeah we're, we're strapped in front of the fire hose yeah you have to stay there yeah yeah yeah, yeah. actually that was a, i think the last question i asked john verveke when he was on my show was like he was talking about psychotechnologies and stuff and i was like so like is time itself a psychotechnology and he made a very 
kind of interesting uh, distinction, right? Because he's like, I'm not saying that time doesn't exist, but like the, the relationship of the human mind, the capacity to kind of participate in time in a particular way is yes, a psychotechnology that kind of like arose in a particular time and context. Mm. And it's like, damn, mm. like what else are we taking for granted? There's this wonderful, I, I haven't read it, but you know the origin of consciousness in the bicameral mind? Yeah. Like, stop me if I'm getting this wrong, but what I understand from that is, is that they, the, the, the hypothesis in that is that when, for example, the Greek myths were being written, they had a completely different relationship to these archetypes. These archetypes were actually almost like physical presences in their lives. And there wasn't this, so it's a really interesting frame to look back at like the way that we're, the, the way that we're criticizing or understanding mm. our, our mythological history or our kind of mythopoetic history has to be fundamentally reevaluated because we're taking for granted a lot of things that the consciousness itself has fundamentally changed through, through history and our relationships to these, like the idea being that we actually did live in a world of gods and live in a world of um, spirits before. And we were actually able to kind of perceive things in that way. Mm. Are you familiar with that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, a, a little bit. I mean, yeah, my sense is that we almost like, uh, as John Vervecki would say, sort of like discovered the kind of psychotechnologies that enabled us to become rational and perceive ourselves as like individuals acting in coherent ways with each other instead of like just sort of like being told what to do by daemons, mm. right? And like that this might have been like a transition point, perhaps that was the axial revolution, maybe. But like just that that too is something that we can't take for granted, that that's like a, an affordance of the context and evolution of human consciousness is like, you know, I think it just speaks to how deep the deconstruction rabbit hole can go and to how much is like up for grabs in terms of how much we could reimagine the human into the future. Yeah, I'm really curious what some of the breaking points were in these transitionary phases because I feel like one of the ones that we're having now is this transition from pure rationality into maybe there's more to experiment with and think about. And which is why I focus on these kind of frame breaking subjects like what is time and is there such thing as all time existing at the same time? What is synchronicity? You know, and a lot of that for me can kind of stem out of contemplating the double slit experiment in mm -hmm. quantum physics. It's like the observer affects what is being observed and literally proven right in front of you. Anyone can see that. So these, I, I get the sense in, in a lot of conversation with people that breaking out of that rational framework is, is what's happening, but also you need, it's almost like you need a rational explanation of why you need to rationally break out of the rational framework. Yeah. Yeah, I think, I think that's what I've discovered as being like the key uh, entrance point is what I, I've been sharing in the context of the monastery I live in is like moving from the sense that uh, perception in the world is something that you are merely observing to realizing that it is something that you are participating in and that it is also participating in you and that that's a kind of like fundamental shift that can take us out of this sense of like things are just happening to us and we're like watching it or consuming it, you know, and like that seems to be one of the core logics that needs to be disrupted. Mm. And I think you're, yeah, absolutely. It's like that shift. Yeah, there's two things that come up. Um, one is another reference to another big book that I haven't read, but I'm fascinated. Oh. John Gebser talked about the breakdown of the mental rational consciousness. Um, and also a friend of mine, Jules Evans, um, put out a, a newsletter quite recently saying, uh, entitled, Dude, Where's My Paradigm Shift? Mm. <laughs> Looking at how, and it's brilliant, it just saying we've been talking about, or the idea of a, an imminent paradigm shift has been present for a long time, like certainly since the 60s, and then you look back, it's actually way before then. And this sort of sense of, okay, one consciousness structure, the mental rational is breaking down, another one is, um, is taking its place. And I've been, like, I, I remember reading Richard Tarnas's um, Passion of the Western Mind, which I still think is one of the best um, analyses of our current psycho-philosophical situation and where we might be going next. I think it's fantastic and I think he's brilliant. Um, but yeah, dude, where's, where's the paradigm shift? Do we always think that we're kind of on the verge of it? And, and is this a tendency, like, is there a tendency that we're all going to be subject to and how do we know 
because we all feel like something's happening, to quote Dave Rubin. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, what, what do you reckon? Yeah, I mean, what's, what's coming up for me, and this is something that I was talking about with somebody earlier today here, is that many of the things that I think have claimed themselves to be paradigm shifts are in fact simply like perhaps the last gasp of the mental rational, the mental rational faculty attempting to push itself beyond what its limits are, right? So like integral, for instance, like for me, uh, it's like, it's like the mental rational mind trying to go beyond itself, but really it's just creating like more, more complexity, more mental rational accoutrements and descriptions of exactly that thing which perhaps created the context in which we find ourselves that needs to be moved beyond. And so it's like there is a way in which all of these kind of meta-theoretic moves aren't the thing. There's something else that is coming online that I think is, for me, is this more like participatory, uh, embodied recognition of a difference in the nature of the human being and the kind of like living forward of that. Mm. Uh, and so, yeah, that's what came to mind. Yeah, that's really well said. And, and I, I think in looking at like, where's dude, where's my paradigm shift? It, it's tempting to just look at that from this holistic, like when's everything gonna change? But I think it's been this little popcorning of the breakdown of rational thinking and, and the exploration of other possibilities that's been happening for the past 60 years or whatever. And it just seems like it's nothing's changing, but we can't look forward in time and define what it is that we're becoming, but you can definitely tell by looking back that this is different, you know? Yeah, and I, I, I like that, I really like that reference to integral, like the, the sense of, and I think this is a real issue in this sort of broader space. Um, that there's people sort of talking about metamodernism and um, integral obviously has a place within it, is the danger of just further intellectualizing a, a process that is actually the end of intellectualizing. And I think the, ra the rational mind has to be integrated, like that there's also in, in the more sort of spiritual space, there's a real denigration of the intellectual as well, which is, which is another dead end. Yeah. Um, I've had these sort of conversations where it's like, well, just stop thinking about it yeah. and yeah. Just, just, just be present with your body. And, and that's sort of the new age spiritual bypass, yeah. like there is a yes and move. Mm -hmm. But what I definitely see in these circles happening again and again and again is just more sophisticated intellectual ways of kind of the mind trying to free itself from itself. And it's just weaving ever deeper webs of abstraction and, yeah. and word salad nonsense. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's a fascinating dynamic, which is I guess bringing us back to the point we made at the beginning about practice, like practice being primary. Yeah. and the embodied being primary. I find what the, the kind of conversations I have with people, uh, if we're going to use the integral model, at, at green level, criticizing past levels and, and saying, stop thinking with the rational, or stop thinking, don't use the rational framework so much. It, that type of speech is never going to work for someone who's hyper rational. But there are kind of codes or, or, or like kind of instigating thought forms that can bring a rational person out of the rational way of thinking that are completely rationally based. I had a conversation with someone yesterday about this. Um, you know, we were talking about synchronicity. He's like, you, you know, I'm a physicist. There's no basis for any of this stuff. And then I was like, well, you're basing everything off of a, a handful of miracles at the beginning of time. And then everything's just locked into materialism from there. It's like, but we all have to agree that we don't know for sure anything. And we have to have the mental agility to be able to experiment with new ideas. And if you're locked in this rational framework, you're not even going to bother exploring these other ideas. So, you know, bringing up the double slit experiment or, you know, just daily experience of the unexplainable synchronicity being the example. It's like these are little things that can break people out of that rational framework that maybe they can start to just question. But, but rationality in, in that orange level of thinking has a tendency of confining people's thinking. Yeah. I find it peculiar that a physicist, because physics has turned into sort of one of the most bizarre, almost spiritual, yeah. like so many of the, of the great physicists were, were fascinated by Eastern mysticism, by the fact that one thing can be two things at the same time. 
and this sense of physics as I kind of my narrative of it in the 20s was that it kind of was like what we're going to identify the fundamental building block of reality oh no it's looking back at us <laughs> and that almost like pulling the pulling the rug under our certainty that then kind of framed like the 20s was such this amazing amazing time you had psychoanalysis starting you had incredible realizations in physics and it was it was when the sort of the rug was being pulled under pulled from underneath the kind of mental rational um, atomistic um, framework um, so I find it bizarre that a physicist would say would kind of our physicist could still be a kind of arch materialist well you know he's a, he was a physicist who is also a rationalist and you can you can be one or the other you don't have to be both and embedded in like our current culture and like raised up in our public education or education systems and subject to our economy you know all of it is kind of like to some degree participating in the reification of that kind of paradigm and so it's like yeah you know maybe one one stream is kind of uh sort of uh, problematizing it but it's a lot of work i think we it's hard to uh overestimate to the de the degree to which the mental rational will kind of like hold on to its paradigm and it's hard to like, it, it, it's easy, I think, to, because we can talk about it, uh, uh, it's hard, it, it's actually incredibly hard to move beyond it, even for like brief periods of time. Mm. And it's like, oof, yeah. One thing I notice about people who are stuck in that materialistic, rational perspective is they, they have this desire for certainty, for a kind of a binary answer, right? But they, they tend to talk about it as if that's coming from their framework instead of which I, I'm observing to be more of an emotional response to uncertainty not knowing the way things are we have this desire because it gives us a feeling of safety to know something is a certain way and then you know rational rationalists or whatever you want to call them tend to use the rational framework as a crutch uh, like it must be proven for me to even experiment with the idea and that's completely limiting Yeah, that is that's a dead end too so, Wondering um, In Maybe going into a little bit of a sort of um, What's the experience been for us in terms of kind of um, I, I love, again, referring to Peter Lindbergh's idea of kind of mimetic artifacts. There's this sort of sense of where um, he, he, had this, um, he said something like, we're all sending out mimetic artifacts into the void and seeing what comes back. And there has been a real sense of a lot of interest in the stuff that we're, we're bringing out, we're putting out. And um, I know, I'm sure you have the same thing, a lot of people getting in touch and a lot of people following the sort of same thread of the emerging conversation. Um, I mean, how, how has that been for for you guys, I mean, especially for, for you, Daniel, being in a monastery and then also being, putting all of this kind of content out mm. and the, the, the paradox of being kind of in the monastery, but also now in, in this kind of interconnected world being available for anyone to kind of get in contact with. Par time. Partially available. I've actually like, uh, sort of like not intentionally, like there's no comments you can make on my podcast. You know, I'm not on YouTube. Uh, I, I don't have a website really. I'm part of this larger brand. It's actually kind of hard to get in touch with me. We're going to put uh, Daniel's email address <laughs> on the screen right now. <laughs> but, like, but, 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 but nonetheless, people do, and it's actually hard because I feel like I want to like give more to them. But I live in a monastery. I live in a monastery, and like you know, I, my time is all very spoken for. Um, but the sense that I get, uh, and I imagine this is true for all of us, is that we're like we are putting out a signal that is creating some kind of resonant field that people are like feeling drawn into, that they want to participate in, that they want more from, like there's some pathos there, like they want there to be more. Uh, and it's amazing, it's humbling for me. Um, and it's super cool to be a part of, like I feel really lucky. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Being that we're out in Bulgaria, I feel it's like self-exiled. Probably feel some of the similar, similar situation for you. Um, and it's some. It often feels like you're just shouting out into the darkness, yeah. shouting these ideas out, and then maybe people are are hearing them, maybe they're not. But um, the fact that you know what I said earlier about that, having all of these different subjects and and talking about whatever you feel, whatever feels like is emerging and, and interesting. 
it's just fascinating to me how people are picking up on a narrative that was never intended. Mm. And that's the same thing I think that we're talking about here. There is some sort of narrative that's just happening while all of these things are simult simultaneously bubbling up around us. Mm. One thread I'd love to pick up from, from our conversation before, which is integration. Because mm. um, we, we mentioned peak experiences and um, I think those are incredibly valuable. But I also think that what a lot, um, like my personal journey has been very much um, like I, I, I find it quite easy to have those peak experiences and my, my personal journey of kind of integrating that into my life uh, has been a long, a long one. And I think that's really valuable to talk about, like what is the, what are the sort of hard yards of integration of these kind of peak um, ego dissolving experiences? Is it hard, hard, hard yards? Hard yards, yeah. Is that it? British, I don't know. Is that I think that's an American thing. <laughs> I've never heard that before. Yeah. It's not a Canadian thing. The difficult work. Oh, I see. Okay. okay yeah. Hard yards. I, I'm sure that's an American thing. <laughs> it's not the sort of thing I'd say. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, good um, question. Yeah. yeah. And just, I mean, one, one thread is, like, I, I became a kind of workshop junkie. I, I, did, I did sort of a lot of plant medicines, um, psychedelics at university, had um, huge openings there that I actually found quite difficult to integrate and went through a, a kind of real dark night of the soul mm. experience mm. afterwards. And mm. sense of the, the phrase I came up with was living in the shadow of myself. Because mm. I had this sort of taste of, of really being, um, mm. really tapping into a, a, a bigger version of myself. And then that was unsustainable through, through the psych psychedelics. And I was sort of chasing that thing for a while. and the gap between that and my myself was kind of opening up. Mm. And then when I found sort of more personal growth oriented work, I, I, I found I was able to access some of the same uh, experience, but it was much more into, I found it more easy to integrate. But, it, that, but I don't think I really was able to integrate it until I had more of those relationships in my life. Mm. Like I was playing with being more honest or being more, um, yeah, playing with, with, with greater depth and greater honesty in the workshop space, but it wasn't until I'd say that more of my relationships in my outside, in the outside world had that quality of presence and honesty and uh, deeper connection that I felt um, more integrated. Mm -hmm. And this sort of, I think part of that is also the, the illusion of, of um, isolation or individuality. It's actually, we're, we're actually highly networked and it's, it's through the quality of those connections and quality of those interactions that can we change those through like authentic relating or circling or any of those more deeper presence practices. That's what really, I think, makes sustainable change. Um, it's not the individual peak state experiences that when we're like, okay, now I'm gonna change everything in my life and everything's gonna be different, yeah. that then kind of we come down over the course of a, of a month or two. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, there's that saying, I think like Tim Ferriss says this a lot, but it's like uh, you are the average of the five people you spend the most time with. Usually it's used in the context of like entrepreneurship and like mm. being materially successful, but like, yeah, right? Like it's, there's a very kind of, we are, I think people in general are virulent mm. uh, in a lot of ways that we don't really recognize and to find yourself in a community, like that's part of the reason I'm in a monastery is like everybody's just like completely dedicating themselves to growth. Um, and so I think that's a huge transition point is when your social network mm. starts to shift and you find yourself in, in relationship with people who are like up to the same game and you're not like isolated anymore. Um, you know, I, my, my sense in terms of like the hard, hard yards of uh, <laughs> this kind of thing is that um, it's different for every person. And I think it's like what you say at the beginning, that it's about following your like interest, your curiosity, like what's pulling you. Like I started with uh, like, you know, intensive meditation retreats. Other people I know started with like therapeutic kind of more trauma healing and then later came to meditation. Other people I know started with psychedelics, right? But like there's a way in which if you keep going, it will just like, it will, it will touch every arena of your life and like letting that go down, right? Like letting it just consume everything over time and not like being like, oh, this is just like, just meditation, right? Or just authentic relating, like allow it to keep growing and consuming you. Mm -hmm. And that's probably like pretty, it's gonna do what it does, you know, like it worked its way. Yeah. You know, it's, it's funny, I agree with you that, that there is a, some place that you kind of arrive at, but that you can go to, go to it from different 
areas. And for me, it's like I've had a rope tied around my legs and been thrown off the back of a car and dragged through all, all of it the whole way. And, and I, so I don't really see it through other lenses of like intentional practice or, you know, a lot of it was just like, no, you're doing this. Life is dragging you through this. Um, but there was an interview that I watched with Jordan Peterson where he described his own kind of awakening experience. And it had to do with, with recognizing that voice outside of his, his own narrating voice that looked at him speaking and said, that's not true. That's bullshit. You don't mean that. And I, when I heard him say that, I, I, I really resonated with that. It was something that I went through a very distinct period of, of like recognizing how much bullshit was just coming out of my face mm. and recognizing the narrator and recognizing that there's a, there's a whole other part of me that is criticizing. And, and so I, I really made a practice out of just figuring out what that voice was. And, mm. and that really was a transition point for me. Like everything cascaded out of that. And I, I stopped getting dragged through the mud after that point, you know, mm -hmm. like, and it, it relates to that attractor thing. I think life just gives you the circumstances you need to learn to be able to, to grow as a person. Some people need a lot of suffering and, and that's my case. But as soon as I gain sovereignty in my own personal growth, I stop suffering, which is amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Well, one thing that's coming up too, is I think we talked about this a little bit yesterday is one kind of, hmm, what is this? Like, uh, place or uh, pull you must pass on this, I think, is uh, whether or not you've been thoroughly humiliated, right? Like, and I, I mean, like, intellectually, emotionally, like, that your whole being has just been humiliated. Mm -hmm. I think um, that, for me, is an actual indicator of, like, okay, like, this person is trustworthy. Mm -hmm. Because otherwise, they're wrong. They think that they... You need to have been broken by life in some way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And life is constantly trying to break you, and it's like, let it. Yeah, you know? that's such a good point. Yeah. I, I mean, have you read that book, um, The Surrender Experiment? Yeah, yeah it's really good. That's, like yeah, that's a really that's good a perfect book. Way to look at it, you know? <laughs> yeah. I don't want to do that. Oh, just do Can it. Can you talk and about then, it? What's, what's the book? Um, so uh, uh, it was a guy, Michael A. Singer, who wanted to just be a monk basically he wanted to disappear away from the world not have to deal with the world and just focus on you know self-transcendence and, and and that kind of thing and there are so many things around him constantly demanding his attention you know he was teaching at a university and he wanted to stop doing all of that buy a plot of land out in the middle of nowhere and just go there and it, i also recognize myself in that too because i just went what's the farthest place in the world i could go to bulgaria sure let's go there and i never came out but one thing he did that was really inspiring to me is he said yes to so many things. It's like that Yes Man movie with Jim Carrey. Like he just kept saying yes and he went through just an amazing set of experiences. Um, I can't actually quite recall all of them aside from one where he became the CEO of a, a large software company somehow. Um, but maybe you remember some of the other stories. No, I just kind of remember that, yeah, that kind of sense of he's just like, like humbling himself in, into life, like just allowing life to tell him what to do. You know, which is, I think, a little bit, yeah, like what I'm referring to, that there is like, like, yeah, it's, there's a humility that requires, I think, a degree of humiliation, typically, yeah. given how we are typically yeah. educated in our world, mm -hmm. uh, to allow that to happen to you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think you're, the, the degree to which you are stubborn is the degree to which life will bash it over your head. And, and you know, I was stubbornly rational, which is why... I also realized that any other talk but rational talk is not going to convince someone to transcend that. But I was very stubborn, so life kept hitting me with that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think it's like you say, like the dark night, like the dark, for in a lot of cases, maybe not all cases, like the, the length of the time you spend in the dark night is the length of time you are unwilling to just humble yourself mm -hmm. and let yeah. go, right? Like when I first got to the monastery uh, some years ago, like that was basically what the, the, the teacher there just was like making me do is just like, no, like you don't get to pretend. You don't get to act as if you know here. Mm. Just day in, day out. And eventually, you know, mm. I just, it's like, fine, I get it. I'm really curious about that, your experience there at the monastery, because my experience has always been, you know, disappear. Uh, and I do think a lot of, at least the stories I'm interested in, which is maybe part of my lens, uh, there's this period with big transformation, there's this period of time of deep isolation and, and uh, even exile 
from society and, and reflection and contemplation. It's the whole like Moses and the burning bush. Um, that whole kind of archetypal story is to me at the heart of a lot of transformational stories. So to have it be in a community setting is really foreign and, and really fascinating to me. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I certainly think it's the case that, like, metaphorically, that happens certainly on retreat, right? Like, you're all there together. You're in the same space, but you're completely alone, mm-hmm. right? You're just in silence, sitting 12 hours a day or whatever. And, uh, you know, there is a kind of existential loneliness that you certainly become extremely aware of in that setting. And I think, in general, in the monastic container, like, you, you, you're aware of how alone you are in this journey. Mm-hmm. And so there, there's a way in which that happens, but you're certainly not like, yeah, you are surrounded by community for sure. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Interesting, I wouldn't have guessed that, that the experience would still be, have that loneliness component to it. Yeah. yeah. Mm. I think there's a, there's a phrase that we came up with on our workshops, which is we have to do it ourselves, but we don't have to do it alone. Mm-hmm. But there is a sort of support, I imagine, at the, at the monastery at least, that that you're, you're with people who are on a similar journey rather than yeah. Yeah, surrounded yeah, with people you can't talk to about it. Yeah, totally. I mean, there's like, there's like um, a, a growing opening to our existential aloneness in, at the same time, a, a deepening experience of belonging and like community and mutuality and support. And so those, in the monastic uh, tradition, as I understand it, like those two things together are part of that kind of psychotechnology or whatever, is that those two come together because one without the other can create a lot of danger, right? Either like just cult-like uh, group mind or, uh, you know, people who do go out on their own can, uh, yes, break through, have breakthroughs, but can also lose track of like ethics and behavior and how to behave uh, in a way that respects the community. I think the speed of awakening also seems to be quite affected by how surrounded by other practitioners you are. Um, I noticed, I mean, at this event, there's been a lot of conversation about isolation and, and finding the others and, you know, where, where are people? And, and I was in that bubble for the longest time, which is partially why we started the podcast, is just put up a flag and see who comes. And in doing that and in starting meetups, which, you know, you guys understand this, you recognize that there's a hunger for this kind of content and conversation and camaraderie that, um, you know, to me, the realization came so late. And I think for a lot of other people, it hasn't come yet. They just think they're alone in, in this stuff. And they're really not. It's really, we're not all so special, you know? Our experiences, that, that whole thing, like you're special, you can do anything you want, it, I actually think works against us. We're so much more alike with each other than we, than we think. And in recognizing that, you, there's instant community, you know? Yeah, exceptionalism is a real prison of isolation. Yeah. Um, yeah, You're touching on two really interesting subjects there. One is community, which is something I feel certainly we're now focusing more and more on how do we build community. And also the sort of difference, um, both of you are kind of um, in self-imposed isolation in a way. Um, and we're based in the middle of London, like one of the, the kind of biggest cities. And it's a really interesting, like I, I feel there's part of me that would, that would love to be kind of living somewhere in the country, countryside, and part of me that feels like that's just impossible. That the, it, I feel like really um, a, a real need to be in what I feel to be one of the centers of things. Yeah. Um, and I mean, the UK is an incredibly kind of centralized country, like everything is focused on London. The media industry is focused on London. Um, politics, like everything ex- exists in London. It's a really centralized place. Um, like I, I, I love the sound of the monastery, for example. I couldn't, I couldn't imagine um, living there, I think, or couldn't yeah. imagine taking that time out. Like I feel this sense of urgency of needing to be in a kind of center to. Yeah, well, we talked about, I think, a little bit about this yesterday, where I, I think there's, um, as we encounter each other's work, there's a way in which I think we're finding out, like, what is ours to do in this sort of uh, ecosystem? And it's like, I don't want that like I don't want I don't want to like wade into the culture yeah. war and and like yeah. t- to, like show people how to have conversations yeah. or whatever like that that just does not appeal to me personally I'm really but and I know that like somebody better do that mm. somebody better do that right yeah 
And yeah, I, 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 yeah, that's a really good point. I feel like that is my piece to hold is what uh, um, that sort of mimetic mediation between different tribes, or at least seeing where the, where the different tribes are, who the liminal figures or figures who might be able to reach between these sort of warring tribes might be, and then to try and do interviews with them. Um, but that's something I feel really drawn towards. Yeah. Actually, that, that puts into perspective a lot of the previous conversa conversations we've had. Like you and I would say Peter Lindbergh have a really solid understanding of the landscape of tribes that, that I have no idea, no clue about. And maybe you're on the same page. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Um, and I think you, you make a sacrifice by being there but also getting that exposure. Like I walk into London, no offense to any Londoners there, but I need to get out immediately. I cannot stay there. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, you're immersed there. So maybe there are some downsides to it for you that, that you haven't expressed, but you're, the ability that you have to see the full landscape of tribes, I find fascinating and Peter. Yeah, which is probably as much to do with the journalistic background as, mm -hmm. as anything. Um, yeah. Yeah, sort of seeing where the tribes are coming from and seeing what the, the cultural landscape is and where the pressure points might be on that landscape, I think is, is kind of what I'm interested in. Yeah. Uh, it could be a matter of my ignorance, but I keep, when I look at the tribes though, I, I also think the solution's still all the same. There's still this hyper identification with your tribe and, and with ideas. And um, you know, if it's not one thing, it's another. And if one thought form or one kind of identity or, or developmental level is breaking down, you just swing over to another one and, and continue there. And so it's, it's part of the fuel for me not to come into the tribal conversation because it seems like the solution should, is just go into isolation. Jordan Peterson says, clean up your room, go focus on fixing your own life and then go out into the world and maybe don't join any tribes, just, just be. Um, what, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, I feel this particularly in terms of the American political context that, and we've, I feel like I've sort of gone in a little bit, every, I, f I feel a real sense of, if I'm gonna start sitting down and having conversations with um, people who are deeply immersed in that, there's so much heat, and there's not some, there's some heat, some light as well, but there's a lot of heat in that conversation. And I look at, um, these political channels that have like um, a million followers or, and, and, and it's such a, I, I feel like the meta conversation is a good place to avoid that um, mm -hmm. in some ways. Like there's a, there's a little bit of hiding there for me because I do, I do know the political landscape well enough to be able to have those conversations and to sort of see where it's coming from. But at the same time, um, I find it quite intimidating. Like it scares, it, it honestly scares me as well because I feel like I need to do a lot more research. I'm gonna have these conversations. I need to be, like there's a lot more exposure. There's a lot more potential for one side or the other to start saying, um, for example, the, um, just a small example, like the, the interview I did with Dave Rubin, for example, was the first interview that I did where I felt, um, he, he's obviously sort of identified with the intellectual dark web and we've done stuff on the intellectual dark web, but I, as I was researching that interview, I was like, I'm also a journalist and actually I think a lot of what Dave Rubin does is there's some serious questions that need to be asked about whether he is fulfilling, what role he's fulfilling in the cultural landscape, how he conducts his interviews, those are really valid questions and personally, for my own integrity, I feel I need to ask him these questions. Um, there wasn't a huge blowback from that. Like we, we don't have the profile for there to have been a huge blowback from that interview, but there was some blowback from that interview. There were some people on the comments thread saying, oh, you ambushed him or you um, were whatever, kind of like you, you're, you're smearing him or whatever. Like a, a taste of that sort of, there's energy there and it's, it sort of feels like it's easy to get pulled into wanting that kind of response. But also, there's a, there's a, it's a double-edged sword as well, um, of like being drawn into that political conversation. But I can see it being very tempting to be part of that Twitter, Twitter kind of um, fighting, and yeah, and, and part of my personality likes that kind of stuff as well. So it's really, 
Um, does that answer your question a bit? Or? I think so, but it also brings up an interesting thought about Dave Rubin. Like we've been discussing, actually, we, I think it was a discussion with you about um, the need for people kind of spearheading uh, uh, new knowledge for, for all of humanity and people who are generalists trying to connect the dots of all these yeah. experts out there. And, and I see um, you and Dave kind of occupying the same sphere, except you're not saying I'm a thought leader of this, of any specific area. And Dave Rubin saying like, I'm, I'm part of the intellectual deep web. He's like, he's not really, he's just putting connections together. And, but you're, you're making an effort not to just be seen a certain way, but also to participate in it, you know, uh, and make those connections facilitate the conversations. But you're not claiming to be anything you're not. It doesn't seem like you're claiming to be anything. Yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd say that Dave Rubin doesn't necessarily claim, like he actually, he actually did say in the interview with me, that he, he feels like the connective tissue for all of these conversations rather than uh, an intellectual himself. So I do want to give him, give him that. I think my critique of, of him would be more... And I, could, I also, I mean, I had this conversation with Jay Shapiro uh, recently. Like, Dave Rubin is a cautionary tale of what can happen on the internet because um, you can easily get into a position where you are, um, audience capture becomes a thing. The dynamics, like this is a fascinating thing. I'd love to explore at length at some point. Um, but the different dynamics between being in the mainstream media to being on YouTube are huge and there's dangers in both. But the, the big dangers in YouTube, for example, a few days ago, um, I put out a film where I talked to James Lindsay, and I, I, it was about impossible conversations. I made the point to him that he doesn't really model that on Twitter, um, and his defence was that Twitter's a performance. And I, put, I played both sides of that criticism. I played a guy who was criticising Lindsay, and then played his response in full, which I thought was a really fair way to do it. I didn't sort of, I didn't. If it had been a Channel Four news piece, for example, I might have led with. Um, with a slightly more sensationalist take and cut it a little bit more. But I played the whole thing. I played the whole exchange. And there were still people in the thread saying, you, you shouldn't treat a guest like that. Mm. It's like, it's fascinating. Like the different expectations we have of YouTube versus mainstream media. And one of the other big ones is that if you're, when I was working for Channel 4 News, if you ask someone for an interview, you're doing them a massive favor. And you have this sort of... Um, institutional authority behind you that you can treat your guests whichever way you want and it's expect it's expected that you will ask them the tough questions if you don't then you're in trouble whereas on youtube it's a completely different dynamic you you have you have a difficulty when you're starting out like if i just attack everyone i had on my channel quickly i get to the point where no one wants to go on the channel so you have this very different relationship with the guests who've agreed to come on and it's very easy to then slip into kind of justifying a very softball style, for example, which I've seen Dave Rubin do. And I also don't think that that in itself is a problem. You have to, in a way, to understand what Dave Rubin is up to. It's a very deep question. There's a set of films by a guy called Timber on Toast, um, where, and it takes him four hours to go through what the problems are with Dave Rubin's show. And it's mainly that he doesn't... Um, it only goes one way. There's a narrative that Davis has about the left and all of his guests fit that narrative and he doesn't push back against part of that narrative that don't fit. And so he's, what he's doing is a very partial rendering of a very complex cultural landscape and um, from another perspective, collapsing what needs to be a very high resolution critique of say the left or the culture into a very low resolution critique. And when he has other people on his podcast who don't fit that and actually have some fairly reprehensible views who if they were on the left he would definitely ask them about and definitely criticize he doesn't criticize them so it's like it's a really fascinating like that dynamic of the different expectations of mainstream versus youtube media and and how that can lead to corruption of the truth on both sides because i think on the mainstream side you just get caught in um sensationalism you just get caught in a sort of pseudo oppositional but you saw that with the Kathy Newman, Jordan Peterson interview where like that whole modality just collapsed because Jordan Peterson was, because of who Jordan Peterson was and who Kathy Newman was, it's just like, hang on, this, is, this whole thing just looks weird. Um, What's interesting about this whole meta conversation and the, the event that we're at right now is, is the, 
analyzing the meta conversation and the places that people are coming from in these conversations. Like what is the intention? What is the thing I'm trying to do when I'm interviewing someone or having a conversation? I like the way Jordan Peterson approaches it because he's just trying to find truth. He's trying to uncover, dig up truth. And people keep approaching him from these lenses of like, what's your agenda? Or try and drag him in the political sphere. And so like there's this whole new conversation that's arising that is is addressing that meta intention behind interviewers and, and people engaged in a conversation that I'm really fascinated by. And, and the three of us are actually all approaching it in completely different ways too, which is like, you know, I'm in a conversation with my wife that other people sometimes join. And it's just, I don't give a shit what other people say. I don't give a shit what the conversation is. I don't care if it's popular or not. I just want to go there. And, and I suffer f for that in other ways. And you said you're having like a dance with the, the person, the person you're interviewing and it's really one-on-one -on -one. so there is more of like that dance you know and you, you've got like this journalistic perspective and, and you're trying to you, you're seeing it through that lens and, and trying to ask hard-hitting questions and do your job as a journalist so um yeah i really find the the flavor that it takes the conversation in to be really different which is why we can all occupy the same sense making whatever you want to call it intellectual deep web space, but have such different flavors in the exact same conversations. You know, one, one thing that came up for me too is like, um, there is a way I think in which the solution is the same for all of these different mimetic tribes, right? Yeah, it is this like humiliation and recognition that my vision and understanding of the world isn't what is actually going to get us there, right? And like, so there is that kind of uni unitary solution and there's this like hyper sophistication needed to interface with the current like reality of how narratives get constructed constructed and how the culture gets constantly reconstituted and and constructed right and like that you can see that and that you can do that like i can't do that i can't see all those things that you see because of your training it enables you to see that and but you also have the vision of this kind of like post identity possible future that I think will uniquely afford you to interface with different tribal systems in a way that doesn't then isn't simply trying to convert them to your tribal system, right? It's trying to invite them somewhere else that we can then kind of be having those conversations. I mean, you have those conversations too, but there's less like gotcha or like trying to catch people in, in our world because we're kind of like playing the same game in a way that I think it's important that we do that, but also we need to call out people who like are playing other games in ways that aren't helping. Yeah. 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 And there's a, like even just the, the, the terminology like gotcha and for example, the, the, the interview with Dave Rubin, which I'm, I'm actually very, um, I, I don't enjoy combative interviews or, or, or that kind of asking the difficult questions. Yeah. But there's been occasion where I've felt that I've had to do that because I'm like, I can't have an interview with this person without doing that. Like the John Cleese interview being a classic example where a few days before he had this huge media storm over comments he'd made about London. I was like, oh no, this interview had been in the works for like six months. And it's like, oh no, now I'm gonna have to ask John Cleese whether um, what he meant by those tweets and a lot of people in the press calling him a racist and stuff like that. I don't wanna, I don't wanna ask John Cleese whether he, whether his tweets were racist. I, I don't want to, this is one of my kind of comedy heroes who is doing us a massive favor by, by agreeing to the interview. And it's like, I don't want to have to do that. But I also feel that I can't not ask the question. And, and that may be my sort of just, just a sign sort of relic of my journalistic background. But I also feel, I feel the weight of, because um, no, John Cleese didn't give any interviews about this, and pretty much everyone in the media would have wanted an interview with John Cleese. So it's a big, it's a big journalistic event or get to have him on the channel at all. Um, and I also know that all of my former colleagues would, if they noticed that that's going on at all, would be like, I can't. I, you call yourself a journalist. You had an interview with John Cleese, and you didn't ask him about the biggest news event he's had over the last three years. So there is that kind of going on as well, and I'm. Cut, starting to second guess myself whether I'm just doing it because of that rather than like what is what what is required yeah, well, um, yeah. but I felt like I know I have to ask him this and actually he was yeah. fine he was fine to reply to that question yeah. um, and I think I think the integrity for me that 
what the, the space that I think we've carved out with Rebel Wisdom is in the, in the free, speech, free speech space. Um, so I think there is an injunction to ask those kind of questions. But yeah, you can hear the kind of the, the triple and, and quadruple guessing that goes on. Yeah, um, you know, I, I liked what you said that there's like, you're tr almost attracted to this space because there's a lot of heat, right? Mm -hmm. Like that's actually kind of calling you. And what came to me was that within the alchemical tradition, right, heat is a necessary part of the transmutation process, mm -hmm. right? If you can actually learn to enter into that, that, that heat and use it to kind of create a transformative process, like mm -hmm. that's huge, that's really significant. And so I kind of actually had the flip where I was like, oh, this, you're right, this isn't gotcha. This is actually like something else is perhaps happening here. It's really interesting. Yeah, yeah, the, the gotcha term was, was because there were some people who referred to the Dave Rubin interview as a gotcha interview. Um, I, I, I firmly disagree with, with that. I mean, I, I, I didn't, like I said, I don't enjoy those. And I didn't actually watch the Dave Rubin interview back for quite a while afterwards because I felt, and then when I watched it back, I was like, actually, that's a really good, I, I was really happy with how it went. I, 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 and I still think it's one of the better interviews that I've done because I, I, I made very clear with the questions that came earlier on why I was leading up to what I was leading up to. Like, what is the IDW? Is it about um, difficult conversations? Is it about, and framing it within a context where I thought it, it led on very naturally to saying, well, how about this and how about this? Um, but it's, I find it, uh, yeah, I don't, I don't enjoy that. I don't find it, but, but I feel... You must. Yes, yeah. yeah. Related to this whole subject of, of how to have a conversation, how to debate, I, I think there's this meta thing happening with this whole intellectual deep web movement, or whatever you want to call it, that is like we're, or at least some of us out there are trying to um, have conversations and demonstrate how to increase sense making and come to truth together through debate sometimes through those difficult hot moments with other people and I think that's really contributing whether people are conscious of it or not to the popularity of this the explosion of this whole movement because we've lost the ability to actually have sense making debates and conversations as a, as a society. And to, to watch these different dynamics, um, you know, arguments and debates actually come to a, a, an end point where we all have learned something instead of just a dick measuring contest. It's like, it's a really, to me, it's a new phenomenon and it's fascinating. And I think other people are tuning in for that reason. And we're, it's also like they're, they're learning from it and applying it in their own lives too. Yeah. Yeah. We're probably hitting the one and a half hour mark in the conversation. Um, I think we should definitely do it again. I've really, yeah, there's a lot of really fascinating uh, emergent um, perspectives here. Is there anything that we feel that we want to um, take the opportunity of the last sort of five or 10 minutes to? Mm. No, this is, this is really pleasurable for me. I think part of what made it so enjoyable was that we like spent time together leading up to this and there's a feeling of like safety and, and togetherness that mm -hmm. yeah uh, I think allowed this conversation to to emerge the way it did and so mm -hmm. yeah it's beautiful yeah I agree yeah I'm also look I'm always looking for that that kind of what value can be extracted, which is actually part of my lens as well. It's like, what is the actionable thing at the end of this? Because as the rational person trying to deconstruct rationality, it's like, what's my homework? What's the thing I take from this? So I'm, I'm interested to know your guys' perspectives on this conversation from that standpoint. What is, at least what is emerging or where do you think this is going, this conversation is going and what is actionable for people or useful out of what we've talked about? Or just personally, what have, has been useful for you? Yeah, in terms of where the conversation is going, I think very much there's felt, uh, certainly we felt this sense of um, reaching some kind of synthesis of the intellectual, the embodied, and the need for in-person um, meetups and events to, to take this work forward 
Um, so we're putting on uh, what we're calling the collective intelligence lab, where we're just practicing with some of these technologies, some of these um, practices, and coming together to see if we can create something that's more than the sum of its parts and orient it towards the cultural moment, whatever the cultural moment is, whether that's having difficult conversations or whether that's thinking about existential risk or whether that, what, whatever the topics are, the, certainly the, the collective intelligence, uh, collective sense making is another good word. Collective wisdom is something I really like as well. Um, what does that look like? And this also this sense of different people from all of these different places. For example, I'm, I'm struck by John Bavaki, for example, um, I think he's got, he's got such an amazing perspective. And also what's been really wonderful to see is he, since he put out, started putting out his series, Awakening from the Meaning Crisis, he has become swept up in this yeah. evolving conversation. And he's met so many interesting people and he's been having all of these fascinating conversations and um, this sense of a community um, self-organizing around these bigger questions uh, is really interesting and really fruitful. So I'm also interested in ha who are the people that should be in dialogue with each other to move these conversations forward. Um, the, the, the sort of ambassadors from the different memetic tribes for a, uh, is, is one way of looking at it. Um, that's an interesting place. It's like, what are, what are, the, what are the people and, co and conversations that need to be had to move things forward? Um, and then what is the relationship between in-person, collective intelligence, practice? That's, that's where I feel the conversation has reached now um, in the last two years. I think, that, I think we had a sort of trajectory of the Trump-Brexit moment of, whoa, okay, something. Th for me, it was like, okay, this is the time. Oh, this is the time when, this is gonna, when all of these things are going to be needed. When, like for me, it's the death, it's the death rattle of the the old way, like Trump is, if we talk about game A and game B, Trump is game A incarnate. Mm. It's like he operates in a zero, he is game theory incarnate, he op operates in a zero trust world, he creates chaos, he, he is, it's, it's, it's basically game theory, prisoner's dilemma where if you trust someone you're a moron because someone will, will fuck you over down the line, Trump is that, Trump is that. And he, so him, like that for me is like, he is the apotheosis of game A. So game B, this, this has to be the time, like over the next however many years, has to be the time for this game B network to solidify and hopefully show itself to be superior at outcompeting game A. Yeah. So it's sort of growing in the cracks of game A. Um, then there's all of these other questions about how, how do you then kind of guard against people who are wow. using co-opting it or using game B terminology without actually being game B, all of that sort of stuff. And knowing that unless we've dealt with our own stuff and desire to, as Jamie Wheel says, like snatch the ring, yeah. like you've got to be and being aware of like, that's where the conversation is going as well. I'm kind of thinking as I'm talking now, that's a big part of, where the conversation needs to go next, especially in these game B network places. It's like, okay, how do we guard against, what's an immune response for mm -hmm. people who are talking the talk but not walking the walk, mm -hmm. who are using it for their own yeah. narcissistic ends? What, how do we guard against this nascent network being co-opted, infiltrated? Um, all of these questions are really alive for me at the moment. Yeah. There's something else that's been happening recently I've really been paying attention to, which is, I didn't think of it before, but people really do try to give up their sovereignty sometimes. They really try to have someone else make sense of the world for them and, and take action in the world. And it, it, it's, it's really surprised me how in even these communities, uh, and, and in the middle of these conversations, we're still looking for that. We're, talk, we're literally talking about sense-making and demonstrating collective sense-making. And yet people may still want to vote you in, in, into some position of power, or me or you, you know, instead of recognizing what's happening in this conversation, which is we're trying to show others how to do it as well. What is collective sense-making? Let's all engage in it. Mm -hmm. um, and it's just, 
I, I just had this vision in my head before that dictators were constantly the types that were co-opting and, and taking power from themselves without realizing how much people are just handing them the power. And that's something I think is, is not being addressed enough in this conversation that I would like to see more of. Yeah. Yeah, for my part, I also see a kind of transition point in the conversation. Um, uh, and uh, I think it accords a lot with, I think, with what you're seeing, like the shift to kind of more participation and collective intelligence. And uh, it, it does feel like the network has become self-aware. Uh, and I, I, th I, I feel like I no longer know what my role is in this thing, actually. Yeah, I think we're, it does, though, feel like we're in a new phase. And this, this event has kind of crystallized that for me personally. And so I feel much more uh, clear about that for my own process. Yeah, it feels like we've been hinting at the future of some future thing. And then, and then this kind of awakening and self-awareness of this movement has made me realize it's here. Like we're, we're, we're waking up to it. We can actually have these conversations on somewhat mainstream platforms and, and get away with it, you know? Yeah, cool. Thank you guys, it's been really, really interesting. And I hope that other people find it interesting as well. <laughs> Rebel Wisdom is a new sense-making platform, bringing together the most rebellious and inspiring thinkers from around the world. If you're enjoying our content, then you can help us make more by becoming a subscriber, which will give you access to a load of exclusive films. Also, you can then join our group Zoom calls to discuss the ideas in the films, and you can send us ideas for questions for upcoming interviews. We're also looking for talented people to help us out with editing, graphics, music, that kind of thing. And if you're a regular viewer, you'll know we talk a lot about the value of embodying or actually living out the ideas that we talk about. So that's why we run regular events in London. Check out the links on the website for more. And hope to see you soon.